There we go. We got you. Nice job. Hey, if you are third, fourth, fifth grade or junior high, we'll dismiss you back to your class right now. Thanks for staying and singing with us. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's the Sunday after Valentine's Day. I have to ask, did, did anybody just knock it out of the park? Tanner raised his hand. His wife's not here this morning. They got a sick little one at home, so of course he did. Hey, one of the things that we did um, as a church, you, you may have not know, you may have seen it or may not have seen it if you follow us on social media, is we did a, a, a little giveaway. We asked, uh, we asked our, our, our church body, who loves people well? We said, hey, of all the people in the church that you know and life groups in different areas and spaces, who loves really well? And we took nominations for, I think for a week, was it, or something like that? And and we, we didn't do a drawing. We were going to draw names, but we, we decided not to draw a name but, because one uh, couple overwhelmingly had the, the majority of people say that, that they love people really well. And, and so um, our giveaway, we got a little a basket of chocolates. There's a, a gift certificate to the Rustic Oven in here. But Sam and Julie, do you guys want to come up? You guys won the contest for the people that love well. Get up here. Or one of you. I mean, you don't have to both come, but people might want to see you. So come on. So you guys make a difference, and there's actually a, a, one of our new beanies in here. So hey, first one, there you go, guys. Thanks for loving people well. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 22, we're going to be uh, in a couple of different places, but we'll start in Matthew 22 like we did, uh, that, like we've done every week. There's one more just quick announcement that I want to make you aware of. Men, we're having our, our breakfast this Saturday at the Grace House. There'll be hash browns and bacon and eggs. Uh, we had a, a, a flat top griddle donated this last month to us. So as Tanner says, we're going to have a real breakfast. It's not going to be, the signs say coffee and donuts. There's not going to be any donuts, but there is going to be bacon. So that should trump anybody that wanted donuts. If you'd be interested in being a part of cooking or anything like that, just see Tanner after the service, all right? Um, hey, I, I might, can, can I just do one more thing before I dive into the message? Is that okay? A little off the wall. It might be slightly embarrassing. Um, I made an edit to my message today. Um, and, and normally, um, I, I feel pretty good about the things that I'm going to say. Like, I don't think they're too edgy. This one might be a little edgy. Um, Becky, can you come here just really quick? Will you, I want you to look at this for me, okay? Let's hear it for Becky. Everybody give Becky a hand. She's really nervous. Can I say that sentence? <laughs> oh man, I'm in trouble now. We'll go with it. I'm not going to tell you what the sentence is. You guys will have to see if you can figure out if I say it or not. Matthew 22. Let's dive right in. But when the Pharisees had heard uh, that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Our first love should be God alone. He is the supreme object of our love. He is the first and last. This is the first and greatest commandments. But Jesus didn't stop there as often he, he didn't. He, he, he doubled down and, and he pushed a little bit further in because he actually knew the heart of the people that he was talking to. And he continued on in verse 39. He said, and the second is like it. Isn't that just like Jesus? He doesn't just give him what he wants. He gives him just a little bit more. How awesome is it that we serve a God that won't just give you what you want or what you need. He'll give you just a little bit more. And the second is like it. You shall love the Lord as your neighbor. Uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's Matthew twenty-two thirty-four through forty. Let's pray, Father God. Thank you so much for today, God. We are blessed to be here. We are thankful and grateful to be a part of what you're doing, Jesus. I I I I, I, uh, I ponder and I think about what's going on at Ashbury Coll uh, College in Kentucky. And God, how revival is beginning to break out across college campuses all across this country. 
God, we pray for that here in Idaho. Would revival start here? God, would your spirit pour out afresh and anew in our hearts and our lives? God, would it start here today as you work in the hearts of your people through worship and the teaching of your word? Father, we love you and we thank you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Uh, I did a little informal poll, not, not, not this one. Uh, this is for next week, and, and thank you for answering that, by the way. Um, I did a little informal poll of, of some people, and I said, hey, so we're commanded to love God. We're commanded to love people. Which is harder? Is it harder to love God, or is it harder to love people? And the overwhelming answer was it's harder to love people. And, and so then when I heard that, I asked the follow-up question. I said, I said, why is it harder to love people than to love God? And then the overwhelming response was, well, have you met people? Can we all agree that people are hard to love? Even the ones that we love are difficult to love. And often, if you're a parent of a child, a teen, or anything like that, right, sometimes, let's just be honest, it's hard to love them because they understand and they, they instinctually know that, that home is a safe place, and so often they'll act out in ways at home that they won't in public or in other places around other people. Uh, growing up, we, Becky and I, when our kids were growing up, we were always told, man, your kids are so well-behaved. Man, I just wish my kids would behave like yours. And privately, we're going, you do not see the, the terrors that they are at home. Right? But they understand that they're loved unconditionally at home. And so that provides a space for them to be able to, to, to uh, uh, I don't know, explore boundaries. They just act in ways that they wouldn't because they know that they're loved. And so, but when they act that way, it can make it difficult to love them. You know, Jesus in Matthew 25 actually equates uh, with, how, with how we treat people, with how we treat him. I, I think that we have it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, starting in verse 34, 35 here, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and, and give you clothes? And when did we see that you were sick or in prison and visit you? And the, the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The, the basis for how we would treat Jesus is how we treat other people. How we treat other people is how we would treat Jesus. And in fact, it's a big point. You can write this down and they'll leave it up there for you. It says, our love for people reflects our love for Christ. And that's not me saying that. That's God's word saying that. How we treat people says a lot about how we would treat Jesus. The reality is, we can't say that we love Jesus and then walk around and be a jerk to everybody we meet. And, and I'm not preaching or talking at you, I'm preaching and talking to myself. I, I fully understand and recognize that if I was in a car behind Jesus and he was driving, he would be cautious about turning from old Highway 30 onto Highway 44. Now what's nice about it is if Jesus was driving, he could just do a miracle and part the traffic and pull out and it would be fine, right? I just tuck in right behind him and turn. How we treat people is how we would treat Jesus. I'm not saying it. That's what the Bible says. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so when we think about it, we, we, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult thing to, to be able to do. When you read 1 Corinthians 13 and you read all of the different things that it says, it's patient, it's kind, it does not boast, it, it doesn't look out for itself, it looks out for, the, for, for others. When you're doing that, it is almost impossible to be able to do that list in and of yourself. And so you have to ask yourself, or at least I do, where's the starting point? Where's the jumping off point? Great, we've got these two commands. Jesus says all the law and prophets hinge on how I love God and how I love people. That's great. So, so where's the starting point? Where do I go from here? What, what's my first step? What's my, uh, in, in church lingo, what's my next step when it comes to loving people, if that's what we're talking about today? I always find it helpful to, to understand who we're supposed to love. And then secondarily, how we're supposed to love them. 
it almost, it, it almost feels instinctual on how we're supposed to love people. It's figuring out who we're supposed to love sometimes is more difficult, at least in my, in my life. And so uh, what I want to do today is, 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 is we go through and we, 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 we look at the rest of the message today. I, I want to look at, at three different groups of people that Jesus says that we are supposed to love. He, he gives us three distinct groups of people that as believers, we are called to love. And, and let's just be honest, if the entire world, not just Christians, would, would put this into practice, the world would be a lot better place. Matthew twenty two thirty nine 39 gives us, uh, and we've already read it, gives us the first group of people that we're supposed to love. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love our neighbors. That, that's, the, that's the first point. Point number one, we are to love our neighbors. And so then you, then, then you have to ask yourself, okay, so who's our neighbor? And then, right, we automatically jump into Luke 10, 25 through 37, the story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody familiar with that? I, if I was thinking, I would have brought like a flannel gram. We could have done like little pictures and it would have been like old school. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Samaritans lying on the side of the road, beaten, robbed, almost to death. Two religious people walk by and won't even give them the time of day. And not only will they not even give them the time of day, it's so bad they actually cross to the other side of the road. And then the Good Samaritan comes along. According to uh, the convention of the day, shouldn't even touch because Samaritans were unclean. They were looked down upon. They were considered half-breeds by the Jewish people. And the Samaritan picks him up, binds his wound, carries him to a, a hotel and pays for not only his, his hotel, but food and everything to, to take care of him and said, I'm going to come back in a little bit, and if there's anything left the, the, on his tab, I'm going to take care of it. Right, and the point of that story, the, the, the reason that Jesus is telling us that is he's saying to us that everybody is your neighbor. Now, he, he, he as we continue, he, he narrows it down into other people groups within your neighbor, but everybody's your neighbor. In fact, the Bible is full of commands about how we're to love people. You can see it on the screen. Exodus 2016 says that we should tell the truth to people. Leviticus 19.18 says don't hold a grudge. Anybody here holding a grudge against somebody? The Bible says not to hold a grudge. Proverbs 14.21, be kind to those in need. Romans 12 says as far as, it is as far as it's possible to you, live in harmony with everybody. Seek the good of others. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Be sympathetic. Be humble. Imagine if we, just the, I don't know, the 117, 125 people in this room put into practice loving in this way with people in our community. Imagine what your world would look like if you did that. Who's that one person? We all got it. Don't Don't lie. And if you can't think of anybody, you're that person. And we're going to, and listen, we're going to talk about that next week. I, I know it was funny, but we're, we're going to talk about what it looks like to love yourself. We're going we're gonna to spend you know, 25 or 30 minutes looking at you the way that, that Jesus looks at you. Because let's be honest, too many of you are going to answer D, or you're going to answer A on this little informal survey that we have. What would it look like if that one person, maybe that person that owes you money or, 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 or said something to you years ago that you've just never been able to get over, or, or did something to you or said something or caused strife or, or, or turmoil in your life, what if you loved them the way that these verses tell us to love them? What would your relationship with that person look like? Maybe it's a family member that you've had to, you've had to cut off a relationship with because of the, maybe the way that they act or something that they've said. Now, I'm not saying that you have to just walk and bring them all back in with, with, with open arms and all that kind of stuff, right? That you've got to be sensible about it. If someone is abusing you either emotionally or physically, uh, that these these commands aren't a, aren't a command to just let them continue to do that. That's not what I'm talking about. I lost too many years with my dad because I held a grudge against him. 
I lost four years with my older brother because of something that happened on vacation. I made the right choice. We packed our family up and we left and we came home early. But I held on to that too long. And so you're not here in the room, but Jody, I know you're going to watch this tomorrow. I love you and I'm sorry. What would our life look like? Who's your neighbor? Who's that person? Let's continue to read John 13, 34 through 35. Jesus gives us our second group of, uh, of people that we should love. He says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The, the second group of people that, that we are called to love is we're called to love fellow believers. Now, they fit under the category of, uh, of neighbors, but this is a little bit different. Loving fellow believers means that we meet them right where they're at. Too often, we use the Bible to, to beat people over the head because they don't see the way that we see. Or maybe they have a, a different theological stance on something that is, is not that important. It's not a, a hill to die on, like the, the divinity of Jesus or the fact that he lived a, a perfect, sinless life, that, that he died and was buried and rose again after three days, that the Holy Spirit is God and he comes and indwells in the spirit and the heart and the souls of believers. Loving fellow believers means that we meet them right where they're at. And it can be hard. It can be really hard. It can be really, really hard because when, you're, when your neighbor is mean to you, it's one thing. But when a, a, a fellow believer treats you in a way that's ungodly, that's another thing entirely, right? Because we, uh, we all recognize what we're supposed to do. We all, we all recognize that we're supposed to love one another. We know what the Bible says. We read it. We understand how we're supposed to treat each other. We know what's coming. You know what the third group is, and I'm not going to get to it yet, but if Jesus tells us to love that group, surely we should be able to love believers. That should be easy, shouldn't it? But when we love believers and they don't love us back the way that we love them, they don't love us the same way that Jesus would love us back, and the wound happens, doesn't it just get a little bit deeper? It's a little bit more painful. Because we know how they're supposed to treat us, and they're choosing not to do it. And in fact, uh, there are people in this room right now, I know that uh, it's everything that you have to just even be able to be at church today because y you've been... Uh, it feels like you've been thrown off the church bus and it's backed over you. you know, there's a, a pastor on the, on, on the West Coast who led a, a very large multi-site church and then some stuff happened and he left his church and now he's down in Arizona and he famously said one time about his church that uh, the growth of his church is littered with the bodies of people behind the bus. Really? Like, you may not be on the right seat on the bus, but there's no reason to throw you off the back and back over you. And so if that's you today, if you're sitting here today and you find yourself, you're that person, you go, Pastor Jason, that's me. I've been wounded by the church. As a pastor who leads them perfectly, I'm sorry. If that's you, I'm sorry. It may not even been Grace. But I know that there are people that feel like they've been backed over the bus, the, the bus that's Grace Bible Church Middleton. My heart breaks for you. We're messed up, flawed people, and we're going we're gonna to drop the ball all the time. And our imperfect love of you, or whatever church it was, please don't let that reflect on Jesus. He'll love you perfectly right where you're at. That pastor or that leader or that youth group person or whoever it might have been, they dropped the ball, they messed up. And I'm sorry. I want you to hear, you may never hear it from them, but I want you to hear it from me. I'm sorry that you had to go through that. If you're carrying that wound, you can let it go today. You don't have to hold on to it. You can let it go today. It, it, it may not be easy to walk into church next week, but you can walk into church next week. 
You don't have to carry that baggage. You don't have to carry that wound anymore. Quit, let's, quit letting Satan stick his thumb into that wound and press it down. Give it over to God today. You don't have to carry it anymore. You know, uh, it, who here has a favorite Bible verse? Be careful, because if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to tell me what it is. John, I looked over and I saw your hand. What's your favorite Bible verse? Do you, can, do you know it? Okay, anybody else? Brave enough? Raise your hands. Lois, I know you got a favorite Bible verse. You have too many? Pick one. She can't do it. Galatians 2.20 is mine. For I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Right? You know what nobody's favorite Bible verse is ever? This one right here that I'm going to read, Matthew 5, 44 through 45. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is anybody's favorite Bible verse? I didn't think so. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I, I just put a pin in it. We're going to continue reading it, but I just want to point out that we're called to love God. We're called to love our neighbors. We're called to love fellow believers. And as I'm reading the three different groups of people, this command is comma and, and pray. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then listen to the condition so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. If that doesn't make you like gut punch, take a deep breath, it should. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you comma, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Nobody's favorite verse, but it's such a good verse. Man, and listen, let's be honest. If you're, any, if you're like me at all, you kind of try and start finding qualifications in this verse. You start trying to find a way, it's like, well, like, Really, who's my enemy? Like, I'm not at war with them, so they're not really my enemy. And really, what does it mean when he says, like, love? Like, maybe we need to, maybe we need to go to the original language. Maybe we need to go to the Greek and see what he's actually saying when he says, love your enemies. If you do that, that's a mistake. Because I'm going to tell you what it means. Love your enemies. The word here denotes a moral love as distinguished from the, the word for love your fellow believers. It's a, a personal affection. So when it says love your enemies, it, it, it's a moral love. Love your fellow believers is, a, is, is, is an affection. The, 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 the former uh, is a complacency in the, in the character of the person lo in love. But when we talk about loving your enemies... It, it, it means literally a, a compassionate outgoing of the desire for the other person's good. And so when, when it says love your enemies, it's not like saying um, take a plate of cookies to them. It literally means that you have to desire for the best possible outcome for them. Is that easy? No. Not at all. It, it's easy for me to, to desire the best possible outcome for, for Cooper or Cam. But for my enemy? You mean, not, not only do I have to love them and desire the best possible outcome for them, for their good, it, it also means that I have to have a compassion and a good will towards them. Like, this is so much more than just like... Um, this is so much more than, uh, than, than a plate of cookies. This is like a complete, full life desire that, that my enemy would do good. That, 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 that they would have good things that happen to them. That, that, that they would be blessed and encouraged. Right? And, and, and if we go back at all, if we even go back like into January, like we write, we understand and we, we talked about it the first week of the series, that, that our love is not best expressed in, in words, it's best expressed in what? Actions. 
So we have this, this people group, our, our enemies. And, and first of all, let me let, let, it, um, I'll call a timeout or whatever it is. I already put a pin in something, so I took that pin out. I'm going to put it over here now. I hope that your enemy is not a fellow believer. If you find yourself at war with another Christian, you need to come talk to me. We've got to take care of that like today. That's a fellow brother and sister in Christ. You shouldn't be at war with them. And if you are right, it's not just in, it's in, it's not just in words or, or good feelings that I want the best or hope the best for them. My love is best expressed in actions. And so what does that look like? It may look like that I have to take the first step. It may look like I may have to own it and just go, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? And it may not lead to a reconciliation, but at least you've done your part. Can we all agree that this just, not just the enemies, but the believers and the neighbors and loving God, does it, does it just feel impossible? Can we just, can we just all admit it? It feels impossible to do it all, right? It, man, it feels, like, it feels like last level of Super Mario Brothers impossible. I'm not kidding. Look at it. There I am. There's little Mario right there. He's short just like me. Where's he going to go? He's got no hope. Maybe, you know, he goes up, down, left, right, back, forward. But, I mean, the one on the left is fixing to take him. And what you can't see is that, that dadgum little dude that's fixing to come in on the cloud and start throwing bombs on top of him. Not only to be, if you get to the right any further, then you got the turtles that are bouncing around, then you got the, the rhinoceroses or whatever they are that are throwing little the axes at him. Like, that's us right there. And we're called to love God. We're called to love people. We're called to love our enemies. And sometimes I don't know where to go. And I'm going to be honest. Sometimes I find myself right there surrounded by laser lines that don't cut through anything else but me. And amen? And it's in those moments that I have to rely not upon myself but upon God's love. Sometimes I don't have it in enough myself to do it. Sometimes it's just God's love flowing through me. See, there's this there's this sense of, of, uh, in which God's love is for everyone in the whole world. And, you know, that's John 3, 16, 1 John 2, 2, Romans 5, 8. Uh, this love, it, it, it's not conditional. It's available for everybody. It's rooted in God's character. It's his nature. It's who he is. His love is for everybody. It's his merciful love. It can be, uh, it, it's, a result of, of, it's a result of the fact that he doesn't immediately punish you for your sins. That he, he pushes off your punishment waiting for you to accept his son. Right, 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but that everyone would come to re repentance. God's unconditional love for the world is, it, it, it results in his call to salvation. It's often called his permissive or perfect will. It's the aspect of God's will that reveals his attitude and defines what's pleasing to him. And what's pleasing to him is that people would come into relationship with him. That's his unconditional love. But not all of God's love is unconditional. God has a conditional love. And you may not have heard that growing up. You're like, Jesus loves everybody. He does. He has an unconditional love that you would come into repentance and be in relationship with him. But there is an aspect and a nature of God's love that is reserved only for those who are in relationship with him. And you can choose to have that, uh, uh, that, that, that part of God's love for yourself. It's easy. You just have to recognize that you're a sinner, that Jesus lived a perfect life, and you just have to ask him to be the Lord of your life. And if you choose that love, he'll give it to you freely. But if you choose not to take that love, then you get the opposite. And that's the part of God's nature that's reserved for only those who choose not to have his love. And that's his wrath.
And the reality is that at some point, either if you if if you pass away before Jesus comes back, that we're all going to stand before God. And you're either going to get experience one of two things, his unconditional love that's reserved for his sons and daughters, or if you're not in relationship with him, you're going to experience his wrath. I'm going to tell you right now, there's, there's only one logical choice, and that's to experience God's love.